The first thing I want to mention this week is that we have a weekly Kahoot where we often go over questions that are on the Canvas content quizzes. So you can see a question behind us right here, and you can partake in these weekly Kahoots Friday at 5 p.m. I have a link in the description below. Check it out. This is last week's Kahoot, but use it to review. And a lot of people use the Kahoot before the test, and I've heard a lot of great results from people. So check out our weekly Kahoot and feel free to join in any of them. There's a prize, and who knows, you might win, but you also might learn a few things. But with that, let's go over here and hop into visualization number seven. So here we are with visualization number seven. Visualization number seven is going to be over decision trees. And it's very important we know how a decision tree works. So we're gonna be going over some of the theory today. When you do your decision tree, make sure you take a random sample of 700 plus the last two of your UTID. I might not do this in a video, but make sure you do it. This is to make sure you have a unique sample that you're working with. Next, you can see right here, we are going to, to analyze predictive model partition. This is how we make our decision tree and you'll be seeing me do this very soon. Next, we're gonna choose the variable Greek life. I will not be choosing this variable because I'll be doing a different categorical variable. Now decision trees, good note to take right here, can analyze categorical and quantitative variables as either the Y or any of the Xs they use. We don't want to use things that are identifiers or act like identifiers. So we want to exclude those from our decision tree. We won't include them in the Xs and we wouldn't use them as the Y we're gonna predict right here. We have right here, take three splits of your decision tree. It might turn out symmetric. You might have split, 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 or you might have split, split, and then a split within a split. But don't worry, as long as you have three splits, you should be good. That's what we want, just three splits and you will be good. So next we need some great screenshots. Make sure to use snipping tool or command shift four and take only of the portions of the screen you want someone to see. So make sure you have a clear and easy to read screenshot. Next. We need you to give the names of the predictors in your write-up that you removed. And these are gonna be the variables that either were identifiers or acted like identifiers. And what is an identifier? An identifier is something that is unique for each and every observation. So something like original row number, got something in my eye, or something like student ID would be something that is an identifier. So those are unique for each and every observation and they serve the purpose of identifying an observation in the data frame. What is something that acts like an identifier? Well, oftentimes those are categorical variables, not quantitative, but categorical. When we have a variable that has so many levels, think about what city were you born in? Now, everyone's probably born in different cities, but then there'd be some repeats, especially Knoxville or Nashville or Memphis or Chattanooga. So in Tennessee, especially, we'd see a lot of repeats, but then you'd have Winston-Salem, you'd have Tampa, you'd have a bunch of different cities, and it might have so many levels, it would almost act like an identifier. So a variable that acts like an identifier is oftentimes a categorical variable that might have 20, 30 levels. It'll have a lot of levels and it'll kind of act like an identifier. So it's not really an identifier, but it's a categorical variable with so many levels, it acts like an identifier. Next, we need to include in our write-up the characteristics and the counts of individuals that were most likely to be in Greek life. So we need to describe their characteristics by following down the tree and then look at those characteristics and then comment on the group and include the number of students in that group and the probability of them being in Greek life. Very important right here. Last, we need to look at the group that is least likely to be in Greek life. One, talk about their characteristics. Two, include the probabilities and then also the number of students in that group. And I'll be doing some similar work to this, not exactly that work. Here's your data set right here. You'll be working with this data set. So let's go ahead and start the example problem. So to start off right here, we're gonna take a random sample. I'm gonna go here to tables, and then I'm gonna to go to subset, and then I'm gonna choose random sample size. I'm gonna put seven plus the last two of my UTID. When I click okay, it's gonna create the random sample. And now we're just gonna full screen it and then double check at all times that you're using 700 plus the last two of your UTID to make sure you're working with your random sample here. Now to make the decision tree, we first need to remove things that are identifiers or act like identifiers. Now I'm working with a pretty small data set right here, but let's go ahead and look at the variables. The very first variable right here is an identifier. Since this is my random sample, I'm just gonna remove it so I don't have to deal with it. I'm just gonna hit delete right here. It deletes out the variable. That variable is now gone. Now, one good way to look at the variables is to look at each distribution. And what you can do is you can click the distribution button and pull it down just a little bit here. 
Now, the quantitative ones we don't have to worry about because even though there are a lot of unique values of height, it's quantitative. It's not a categorical that we would have this issue with They were where it would act like an identifier. We have here gender, we have here uh, handedness, and let's go further across. We have here significant other and other quantitative verbals. You can see the histograms, very right skew histogram, right to the high, left to the low, whatever way the tail goes. Just make sure you realize it's going to the right side right there. And I don't see anything that is an identifier or acts like an identifier. Now in your data set, there will be things that act like identifiers. Make sure to delete those out, but then also list them. So record them before you delete them to put them in your report that you removed those variables. And it would generally be things that have a lot of levels, maybe 20 levels, 15 levels, but a lot of levels. And we're talking about these categorical variables we can see right here with the red icons. Those are the ones we're gonna be really concerned about that may act like identifiers. So let's go in and start to make the decision tree by going to analyze, predictive modeling, and then partition. This is how we make a decision tree to start. Now, when you make a decision tree, my favorite thing to do is click inside of here and select all the variables at one time. So we've now selected all the variables. And with all the variables selected, I'm gonna hold Control or Command, Command on a Mac, and I'm gonna deselect one of these. That's gonna be my Y variable for this problem. And now we're gonna take and drag all of these to the X's. So you put everything in the X, you want to see if it explains. We're gonna use all those as explanatory variables. And then we're gonna take our one Y variable and put the one Y variable here. You can go through and kind of drag them all in, but this is the easiest and quickest way. And you wanna make sure you have all your X variables in here because all the X variables are gonna have a chance to try to explain the Y variable. This is why this is such a powerful tool. So what's gonna happen here? Well, we're gonna see which variables are the best explanatory variables. Now that we've made our decision tree, let's go ahead and color the points. And this kind of looks like a stacked or segmented bar chart right here. We're gonna make it look more like a mosaic plot in a second, but we need to note that when we do this first split right here, this is the most important split. The first split in a decision tree is the most important split, and it's gonna control the rest of the decision tree. So the most important variable in predicting significant other is how much people text. So let's take a look at what this means right here. We have right here the distribution of the Y variable, yes, and the distribution no for the right split. If you notice, there's more red here and more blue, he less blue here. So we have the distribution of how much people have for significant other with this group having a little more no and this group having a little more yes. Every time you see this red and the blue right here, this is the distribution of the Y variable. We also have the counts of individuals. There was 723 people to start, and then there were 441 split over here and 282 split over here. The people on the left text greater than or equal to 30 times a day. The people on the right text less than 30 times a day. So this is the X variable splitting it apart, and the tree decided this. We didn't decide it for the tree. Next, let's go here and split again. We have two more splits to do. The next thing we split on is phone contacts. And we get a group over here that is very much having a significant other, very high probability right there. And these individuals have less than 75 phone contacts. They text a good bit, greater than or equal to 30 times, and they have less than 75 phone contacts. It looks like about 85 to 90% have a significant other. Over here, we see people who text greater than or equal to 30 times a day. And then we have the number of phone contacts they have is greater than or equal to 75. And it's about a 50-50 split. You can also see that up here in the mosaic plot. And it's important to note that this is the first leaf, the second leaf, the third leaf. And what do we have here? First leaf, second leaf, or third leaf. Last but not least, let's split again. And we did get a symmetric tree. If your tree is not symmetric, that is okay. Do not worry. Just make sure it says three splits right here and you are okay. So now with our three splits, we have that this final split we have are individuals who text less than 30 times a day. These individuals lay, weigh less than 140 and they're about a 50-50 split on significant other. And these people weigh greater than or equal to 140 and they are more likely to not have a significant other if you look at the distribution of the Y variable. At all times, this is the distribution of the Y variable within the split. So looking at this right here might be a little bit difficult, but there's an easier way to read it. The easier way to read it is to go ahead and go to the leaf report. The leaf report lets you see what's in the terminal leaves, the very bottom leaves. So let's go ahead and look at the leaf report. And what do we have? Right here is leaf one, leaf two, leaf three, leaf four. 
that would make this leaf one, leaf two, leaf three, leaf four. And here we have leaf one, leaf two, leaf three, leaf four. So you can actually tell how many people are in each leaf, which is gonna be important for our write-up. When we look at the first leaf right here, which are individuals most likely to have a significant other, the individuals most likely to have a significant other are individuals who text greater than or equal to 30 times a day and have phone contacts less than 75. These individuals consist of six people who do not have a significant other and 36 people who do have a significant other. So it's very important here we can identify the numbers right here and do the calculations. The people who were least likely to have a significant other would be right over here. And these individuals are the individuals who text less than 30 times a day and also have a weight greater than or equal to 140. There were 137 individuals in this leaf who do not have a significant other and 40 individuals in this leaf who do have a significant other. And we can calculate the probabilities. Now that does the majority of the assignment, but don't leave here. There's more to learn about decision trees, which I'm gonna mention. The other big thing we need to know is the R split history, and that is found under split history. So let's go here to split history and look at the R squared. Now the R squared is the percent of variation explained in Y by the variables in the tree. And unfortunately my tree does not do a very good job. We're just gonna get a good view of the R squared right here. I've only done three splits and the R squared is very low. The value of R squared is currently 7.2. So when you interpret R squared right here, we'd say 7.2% of the variation in whether or not somebody has a significant other is explained by the variables in the tree. So understanding that interpretation is very important because we want to say how good our tree does at explaining whether or not people have a significant other. So it looks like at this point for the survey I did, we might not have a good view on why or why not people have a significant other. You can also see the mosaic plot is just doing a categorical categorical display of data by splitting people into groups. And with this, you should have all the knowledge you need to complete visualization number seven and hopefully had some good review of decision trees.